Welcome to the Cried in My Cheesecake podcast. I am Danielle, your host, and this episode is actually pre recorded from our free webinar series that we offer here at Cried in My Cheesecake. Um, monthly is our goal, and we are working toward that. But this this week's podcast or this episode is about the idea of um, improving our energy. So many of us are so low on energy all the time, and we just it's like, it's just second nature to go to the coffee. It's second nature to head to that muffin or head to the vending machine at lunchtime or right after lunchtime, you know, we just ate and yet why are we still hungry? Why are we still craving things? So in this episode, um, Aria, my teammate here at CIMC, she and I go and flesh through this for you and give you some practical tips and advice on how to approach getting more energy in your body so that you're not relying on everything else and having symptoms of like headache and brain fog and that afternoon fatigue and um, uh, uh, <laughs> energy issues. All right, welcome to our CIMC monthly webinar series. This night or this um, time that we're meeting, we are talking about how to improve your energy and focus even when you're always busy. I don't know about you, but this time of year is ridiculously busy. It's like we get so excited. We think summer's really busy because it's mostly unstructured, but then we move into the fall and it's, and it just continues to ramp up, ramp up, ramp up through the holidays. And before long, again, I don't know about you, but I tend to lose myself a little bit in all of the busyness. And this is kind of Arya's and my, um, Kind of just like a hand to kind of hold you and let you know we see you we know you we value um, we value you here at cimc and we want to make sure that you can enter into this last part of the year really well all right just a reminder that this webinar or podcast is for informational purposes only and some of the information may not be the best fit for you the disclaimer is here. If you need to see, go to my website and see it. But always check with your own physician before we say, before implementing things that we do. Um, neither Aria nor I are a registered dietitian or a medical doctor. All right, Aria, why don't you start? Why don't you start talking about yourself? Introduce yourself. Okay, I will. So I'm Aria. Nice to meet everybody. Um, I am, uh, I've been on Danielle's team maybe a few months now since the summer. Um, I became a practitioner in CIMC. Um, Danielle and I went to the nutritional therapy program together where we met and um, it was just, we knew we had to work together from there. So um, I like to specialize in thyroid health and all that kind of stuff, gut health. And um, yeah, that's my journey. I'm a mom of three, I'm a busy lady, but nutrition is my passion and I am here for your support as well. So excited to do this webinar on such an important topic. Yes. And I am Danielle Hofer and I'm also an NTP. Uh, Ari and I met seriously, I think it was like the first month of our program and we were peer partners and just, we really hit it off. We have similar worldviews and I would say priorities in life maybe. Um, yeah, but I also have three children. I homeschool my three children and I run this crying to my cheesecake business full time. And I just am really passionate about helping others. If I can help one person not have to go through heart disease and diabetes and what that does to families and children for generations, I would have done my job. And that is my, the liver, heart disease, diabetes. That is my passion. And that's why tonight's webinar is kind of like, I got so excited about it. And I think Aria just kindly and politely like settled me down a little bit um, and had it, had it so that I didn't go overboard with the topic. So thanks, Aria. Oh, of course. <laughs> All right, our overview tonight, we're going to talk about symptoms, like the symptoms that we talked about in the advertising of this. We talked about fatigue, headaches, brain fog, and hanger. You know what hanger is. Um, we're going to talk about blood sugar imbalance. We're going to talk about all of the stressors that affect blood sugar amounts, maybe not all of them, but enough for you to get the general idea that blood sugar is really important, whether you have diabetes or not. And then we're going to talk about mitigating all of those symptoms of the brain fog, the headaches, the fatigue, and the hanger. Okay, so symptom assessment. So we're going to kind of go through... Uh, what are the basic symptoms of blood sugar imbalance? I mean, you may have these symptoms and you may not even realize that they're related, right? So 
take a little time to, um, to go through this assessment and ask yourself these questions. Do you deal with the dreaded 3 p.m. crash? Are you reaching for caffeine or sugar at, you know, in the afternoon to get through the rest of your workday? Do you feel hangry or sleepy between meals? Basically, if you're not familiar with hangry, you're hungry and angry at the same time. <laughs> you have frequent migraines, brain fog or fatigue, you know, basically like that cloudy head feeling where you walk into a room and you're like, why did I come here? Maybe you have blood sugar imbalance. These are very common symptoms of that. Yes. So these symptoms, like, again, we kind of think about these things as in isolation of one another. And I would almost say, Aria, that we get into a habit that that 3 p.m. crash, we don't even recognize that crash anymore because we have begun to use substances to help us mitigate that crash, right? Like it's common, like after we eat lunch that, oh my gosh, I'm still hungry. Well, no, you're not. You just had four, five, six, maybe a thousand calories. You're not hungry. There is a reason that you're feeling this crash where you need to eat something else or drink something else to perk you up. Um, so yeah, this, these, all of these things are connected and I would say even like dizziness or, um, uh, what else, uh, even like emotional issues, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, stress or like just not being able to manage your stress, things like that. Yep, exactly. Um, all right. Blood sugar imbalance. So what is blood sugar imbalance? Well, let's first talk about our genes, our genetic makeup, like who we are as human beings and our environment. So when we, when humans were way back when, right, humans food consumption was unpredictable and inconsistent, meaning they didn't know necessarily when their next meal was going to come. They had to go and hunt for it. They had to go and scavenge for it, but they did not have consistent food supplies. So our blood sugar, the whole idea of blood sugar is to help use excess stored energy. Excess stored energy is the nice way of saying excess fat on the body. Um, it, is ex it allows for excess stored energy on the body so that when food supplies were low, that you could use that energy on the body and survive. No big deal. No big deal. Like, yeah, you'd be a little hungry, but your body would actually be working for itself and understand, oh, I'm going to get more food here in a little bit. But this extra, um, like the extra stored energy helped with raising low blood sugar levels, which is what fasting is. So I know you've probably heard of the term fasting, fasting as a way to eat. Um, it's really popular. And typically if it's a New York Times bestseller, it's probably not a good eating method or a good dieting method, okay? Because there's a lot of things in behind all of that. But excess stored energy is meant, extra fat on the body is meant to raise the blood sugar levels so that people could survive. People can continue moving. People could have the energy they needed when they didn't have food, okay? So the food that they were getting would be, again, seasonal and it would be whoever hunted whoever gathered that kind of thing the food that people had access to was very rich in life-sustaining vitamins and minerals I'm, i use the words life-sustaining because a lot of our soil to the day we could be eating the same spinach that we ate you know years ago like oh spinach spinach it's not necessarily the same because the soil has been so depleted of minerals that it's not necessarily, yeah, you're getting some things from that spinach, but it's not the same spinach of years ago. But back then, food was had life-sustaining vitamins and minerals and was packed with filling fats, proteins, and fiber. Okay? So fats, proteins, fiber. We'll get into that a little bit deeper here in just a little bit. But foods like simple carbohydrates back way back when, even in my, like my childhood, I didn't have access to as many simple carbohydrates as we have now. I didn't have fast food restaurants. I didn't have, Skittles were a rarity. Cause remember, do you guys remember even when Skittles were super expensive? Like I didn't get those things. When I say simple carbohydrates, I mean highly processed, highly refined, quick energy. These were not available. And in fact, berries and um, fruits and things like that were very scarce as well. So when I say fats, proteins, and fibers, fats and proteins were first because those allowed the body to have balanced blood sugar at the time. However, we move into our environment today. 
our environment today is we have food at the access of our phones. We tap a, we tap a glass screen or a plastic screen, whatever it is, and we have food like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, I feel a little bit of hunger in my tummy. I'm just going to run through that drive through Oh, you know what? That, that cupcake sitting there, it's just sitting there and calling my name. No, it's not. We have so much stuff available to us in the moment, like, and we can be fed just like that. Those are simple carbohydrates, and those kinds of things were very rare, and our bodies were not meant to process those things. So that is how that kind of works, and if you have questions about that, please feel free to ask. But that is kind of the overview, a very generalized overview of how in the in back in the day versus today that our bodies are still the same, but we have a, a whole different environment that is causing a lot of dysglycemia. Dysglycemia is imbalance, which means you have blood sugar problems, which means we have problems like cravings for sugar. We have problems like weight gain. We have problems with increased blood pressure, um, issues burning fat. So we may be eating all we need to be eating, like eating our macros or whatever, and still not losing weight. Um, difficulty, um, or I'm sorry, increased hunger and less satiation from your meals. Mm -hmm. That is level one of blood sugar dysregulation. That's level one. When we think of blood sugar dysregulation or dysglycemia, we think, oh, diabetes, my A1C, and my fasting glucose. Those numbers matter. Diabetes is a problem, but diabetes is level five of dysregulation or dysglycemia, not one. We have four levels of warnings telling us that our body is like trying to communicate to us, hey, hey, something's wrong. Hey, something's wrong. I got a headache. I can't get this weight off my hips. I can't. What I, all of those things, the, he, the headaches, the fatigue, the brain fog, the hanger, those are all level one issues that say, or your body is trying to tell you, you have a blood sugar imbalance. Okay, so let's kind of get further into these symptoms and um, what they could possibly be meaning. So if you're getting through your day, you're very sluggish, you're very, you know, low energy, a lot of the times, maybe you think you even have a blood sugar imbalance in the reverse. Maybe you think that you have a, an issue with not having enough blood sugar, right? Or, or not enough, your blood sugar is low. That's what I mean to say. A lot of times you hear, or your doctor may tell you, oh, if you're feeling sluggish throughout the day, maybe you need to have a little treat or something to get you through. Well, this isn't good. <laughs> this is what causes a blood sugar roller coaster. So if you can see this little graphic I put here, I love this because this really explains that kind of reactive hypoglycemia pattern that a lot of people tend to have and may think is normal. So when we don't eat the foods to support our blood sugar, if we're not getting enough protein and fat, in addition to our carbo carbohydrates, we're left feeling drained. Um, having too much processed carb carbohydrates really zaps our energy and kind of has our blood sugar going spiking up because you're eating that food without things to kind of cushion the, the blow of the blood sugar um, or the insulin release in the glucose. And then you're going back down again and your body kind of needs that sugar to kind of get you regulated, but that's not where you need to be. Where we really want to be is this little, um, if you can see this little roller coaster with the veggies, <laughs> like, and a, a slight hills and valleys, you know, that's what we want. We don't want these high peaks these dips and then, you know, high peaks again. So what this does is, you know, it causes us to, it taxes our cells and it causes inflammation of our cells. It causes mitochondrial death even, which is like, these are the, what feeds our cells, right? The energy in our cells. So when we're not eating to support that, we're all over the place. And um, this is kind of what this image illustrates. So fatigue is a symptom of that. When you're crashing constantly throughout the day and you feel like you need that sugar, it's really quite the opposite. You need a little less and you really need to be eating more proteins and fats, which we'll get into more later to support um, your blood sugar and keep it on a steady, nice path throughout the day. Yeah. Aria, I love this graphic. When I saw it, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so good because I think you're right. Like we, we have been taught like, oh, if we're low, oh, it's okay to have that sugary snack, those, um, uh, what are they called? Like juice boxes or um, like the Welch's fruit snacks or some people eat, you know, just whatever, right? And really, if you're having that up and down crash, like Aria said, it, you're imbalanced. 
And a group of people that I work with that I see this happen to a lot are people who are post bariatric surgery. They are taught that they're going to have blood sugar crashes. So then instead of teaching them to eat a balanced across the day, like eating balanced foods, again, we're going to go over that. Um, Their doctors tell them, oh, you're going to have blood sugar crashes. It's okay. It's almost encouraging them to engage in their poor habits from before surgery, where like before surgery, they're not supposed, they're supposed to kind of diet and get down and whatever. But it's almost like they're trying to engage them in poor habits from before surgery that got them to bariatric surgery in the first place. So these spikes and peaks are eye-opening for many. The next symptom that we're going to address are headaches. I am the queen of headaches. I don't care. You can give me COVID again. You can give me whatever again, but give me a headache and I am done. Headaches knock me out, and this is a sign and a symptom that my blood sugar is imbalanced and many other people's are imbalanced. Um, I grew up with migraine issues. Um, it, It was, it's awful. Headaches have been in my life for a very long time. But I have perfect A1C, perfect fasting glucose, perfect cholesterol, perfect everything. And yet my doctors tell me I'm healthy and I'm fine. And they could not find, I went to neurologists. I had um, brain scans done. I've had so much done on my, just to like check out and see what's going on, what's causing these headaches. That's how bad they've been. And when I found out that all my headaches are rooted in blood sugar, oh my gosh, it changed everything for me. So sugar, I don't want to get to the place where we're like, oh, sugar is bad, sugar is evil. I want you to think of sugar as a carbohydrate because there are some bad sugars that cause inflammation, but sugar should not trigger you and think, oh, it's bad. I'm going to gain fat. Not necessarily. And we're going to teach you how to balance this because sugar is vital to us to keep us alive. When you go to the hospital and you are given um, fluids and whatever, do they shove a fat IV in you? No, they don't. They don't shove a protein IV in you. They shove a glucose vial in you because glucose and sugar are important to keeping us alive and healing and so forth. So sugar is vital, but too much or too little can cause headaches. So just like that, um, the little character thing that Arya put on the last slide, too much or too little can cause headaches. The direct effect on your, it's a direct effect on your brain and nervous system. So you have this um, area in your brain, it's like in the center part, I think, I'm pretty sure, Um, but it's called the HPA axis, the hypothalamus, pituitary, and adrenals. So the HPA axis starts here and it runs clear down your back into the area right above your kidneys. This this area helps to control the your blood sugar regulation hormones glucose and insulin. I'm sorry, glucagon and insulin. So this is all important, but also is connected to your stress. Okay. We're going to talk about stress here in just a few, but the too much and too little blood sugar has a direct effect on your brain and your nervous system. Like this is so important to know, like, oh my gosh, did I eat like terribly imbalanced last night? Is that why I have a headache? Making these connections. Yeah. Headaches could be dehydration. Yes, headaches could be um, stress. Stress, blood sugar. Dehydration, it causes stress on the body, causes blood sugar dysregulation. It's all correlated here. So the glucose gives your body enough energy after eating the carbohydrates. I want you to think of a campfire. When you start a campfire, you're not starting it with logs, right? You're starting it with kindling. Kindling is like your carbohydrates. They burn up fast and they burn up hot. Your protein is like the little bit bigger sticks. It takes a little bit longer to digest them. It takes a little bit longer um, to absorb them, that kind of thing. But the log is your fat, all right? The fat just keeps it burning for a long while, okay? But that's the reason why carbohydrates give you that big boost if you're not, if you're not eating balanced. Again, we'll talk about this. But if you're not eating balanced, your blood sugar is going to rise straight up, burn hot, and you drop immediately because... There's nothing else with it to slow it down. Um, headaches also happen because the, the body is so hard working to keep your blood sugar level, like literally like within a super tight number. 
that's how important blood sugar is. That's why we have these symptoms of the headaches, the brain fog, all of this, because your body is trying to communicate with you, oh my gosh, we're having a hard time keeping this number like this. Help us. And any kind of change in glucose level affects the brain more than any other organ. These rises and drops, constant up and down, causes headaches. You would say maybe tension headaches. That's one of them. And the headaches caused by glucose in your brain are also related to, like I said, the hormones that are activating your sugar levels. So the hormones like your insulin, all of that, and your adrenals, your um, cortisol, your norepinephrine, your dopamine, your um, epinephrine, all of those are also constantly going like this inside every time you have a sugar high and a sugar low. Yeah. <laughs> so to kind of add on to that, you know, brain fog, right? So do you find yourself forgetting things? Um, like I mentioned before, you're walking to a room and you're like, why am I here? Why am I here? You know, a lot of times we'll say, oh, I'm just getting older, you know, chalk it up to old age. No, like, you know, our brain, if we're supporting, if we're eating to support our blood sugar, we're also eating to support our brain. And you know, like Danielle mentioned in the last slide with the headaches, it all has to do with that HPA access and, you know, the communication from our cells to our brain, to our blood. So it's so important, um, you know, consuming too much refined carbohydrates can cause inflammation because you're having a lot of those spikes. Like I said, the spikes really do cause issues with your cells um, because they're getting stressed out and they're, some of them die and, you know, they're like, what's going on here? And when this happens, on a cellular level for years and years, it can lead to oxidative stress. And this is what causes those metabolic diseases like we talked about earlier, the diabetes, um, type two diabetes specifically, um, high blood pressure, hypertension, you know, those things, a lot of times we hear are due to high cholesterol or we're eating too much fat, but really what it is, is sugar and the direct effect that it has on our heart and it stresses out our heart. So all these things together will cause us to kind of have that brain fog and that cloudy head um, and, you know, I do think some of it is normal, but, um, you know, with age and things like that and just general life and stress, but, you know, having this all the time where you can't focus and concentrate, that's not just because you're aging. That's because you need to be doing things to support your brain better and, um, not eating as much sugar or eating more balanced, like we'll talk about is going to help with that. Okay. So hanger, <laughs> I love this little graphic because. Um, I real like, you know, you know, those Snickers commercials, right? You're not you when you're hungry. So apparently they did a marketing campaign where they had one saying you're hangry <laughs> when you're hungry. They also had one saying like, um, a bunch of other crazy things, but isn't this so funny that a company that sells sugary processed candy knows exactly why, you know, why this is happening. <laughs> Basically they're saying, Hey, you need that sugar to get you through um, your day because you're not acting like yourself. Well, no, I mean, it's very clever because that's what a lot of us are conditioned to think. Like we talked about in the roller coaster slide, we're conditioned to think that we need that quick pick me up and Snickers is a perfect example of that. So look how predatory these companies are. <laughs> they know exactly, you know, that the, it's not true and that we think we need sugar to get us through. So um, if you're not eating to support your blood sugar, you're going to feel a little bit cranky between meals, you know, aside from being just sleepy and fatigued and maybe with the cloudy head and the brain fog, you're going to kind of, you might be short with your loved ones. You know, you may, um, get snappy with them. A funny story that, um, now years looking back, I realized why this was happening. Uh, one of my best friends and I, when we were in high school, we used to go out for lunch every single day, right? We would get at Wendy's McDonald's fast food every day on the way there to our, our destination. We were snippy with each other. <laughs> We needed our fix, our fast food fix. And none of that is balanced, you know, French fries, whatever. So it, now that I'm looking back and, you know, I, I'm a nutritional therapy practitioner, I'm like, oh, I was hangry because look at how I ate. <laughs> I was literally eating processed food to get through my day. So, you know, that's a silly story, but it just goes to show that a lot of us, it's so common that we deal with this and, you know, we should be able to get through breakfast between breakfast and lunch without being hangry without being angry and snippy with someone, you know, we should be able to get through the day. If we're metabolically healthy, we should realistically be able to get through four to five hours without our next meal. You know, say if we need it to, for some reason, because we're busy or whatever, sometimes life gets in the way and you can't eat as consistently. 
So that's a sign that your blood sugar levels are under control and that you are metabolically healthy if you're able to get from lunch in between lunch and dinner and even beyond that. So, you know, just think about that. Next time you get hangry, what did you eat for breakfast? Maybe you ate something that didn't support your blood sugar. Another stressor affecting blood sugar imbalance. And I think Ari and I are going to um, kind of tag team on this. Um, some stressors affecting blood sugar imbalance. I'm going to start with lack of sleep. Um, I'm going to use this example of a client that came to me with extreme insomnia. Like it was, I don't even know if the gentleman was sleeping four hours a night. And if he was, they were not um, back to back hours. It was a consistent, um, it was just consistent. He had acid reflux, like something serious. I mean, he had, it was so bad that the doctors were trying to provide him relief. And so they stretched his esophagus. And of course that made reflux even worse. Um, he was gaining fat just right in his belly, right in his belly. And he was craving things. He was drinking tons of caffeine, like lack of sleep. Oh, and he was drinking lots of alcohol, not like in a, he was abusing alcohol, but it was just part of, well, I had the caffeine. Now it's time to come back down. And he had so much stress in his life that he wasn't even able to sleep. And usually blood sugar imbalance and lack of sleep go hand in hand. Um, if your blood sugar is imbalanced, you are not going to sleep well. You are not going to get that REM sleep. You're not going to get that deeper fifth level of sleep on top of that where it's healing and just um, restorative to your digestive system. So you'll notice that some people with blood sugar imbalance have digestive distress. They have thyroid problems. They have, um, again, the weight gain, they have all of that. And then the stress of life, your stress of life is going to cause blood sugar imbalance. The ability to adapt and overcome without cravings, without needing caffeine, without needing a substance of some form to get through, including a substance of prescriptive medicines. The stress of life can cause blood sugar imbalance. And I added this one in here too, Aria, you're welcome to join in on here, but excessive exercising and movement. Um, there are a lot of women who are postmenopausal who think that they just need to keep going, just keep going, just keep going, when actually that's not helping them. They're having more blood sugar imbalance. They're, they're, they're moving more, but still have that like pudge between the belly button and the pubic bone where they're just tired of, of housing all of that fat. And they're just like, oh, like it just won't go away. That area of the body around the, for the woman, around the hips, around the belly button, like, and lower is a good sign that there is a blood sugar imbalance situation happening and maybe moving more or is not going to help you, but moving efficiently and productively is going to help. Mm -hmm. Aria, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, definitely. Like working out smarter, not harder necessarily, mm -hmm. because um, like Danielle said, you know, this is something that can really put taxing, be taxing on your body and put stress on your body. And then if you're already dealing with some imbalance, you know, it's just only going to make it worse and kind of drive that. And to also to kind of what you said about um, with the sleep and everything, and also with the um, lack of sleep, you know, can mess with our hormones and kind of can make help us can kind of alter our decision making, right? Like if we're sleepy and we're having trouble get through the day, we may have more of those cravings because things are kind of imbalanced in our brains that are, you know, making us have those cravings. Um, another thing that I think is really important to note is when we're constantly eating between meals and snacking rather than, you know, because we're hungry and we didn't eat enough on breakfast or whatever the case, what we're doing too is we're activating reflexes in our body that can kind of stress us out too. Like our body needs to kind of get in that rest and digest between meals. And if you're constantly picking, you know, I know a lot of people will be grazers, right? They don't eat meals throughout the day. They kind of just pick here and there, you know, even while they're making dinner for their family. I used to do this, like you're picking, snacking on things. You know, you don't give yourself, your body a chance to kind of restore as well and kind of just rest and, it's, it's always working and it needs to take a break every now and then. So that can kind of be another stress that can heighten all of this as well. And then um, insulin resistance versus metabolic inflexibility. Um, do you, so metabolic flexibility, we want to be metabolically flexible. That means that we can use our stored fat or stored energy on the body and not, and still have a good balance. That's again, if you can burn the fat and use the fat on your body, you are metabolically flexible. 
inflexibility means that we just continue gaining and putting, making more fat stores. Why does that happen? It's because of insulin resistance. Insulin resistance, like, so when, when we eat, our pancreas makes insulin and it's like, okay, let's make some insulin. Let's go around the blood and pick up all of these, um, all of these sugars from what you just ate. So then when it does that, it's going to let the cells take whatever, whatever the cells don't need at the time. So whatever they don't need at the time, the insulin moves it around the blood and takes it to the liver, to the adrenals, to your muscle tissue and to your excess fat. If you don't have enough excess fat or all of the other stores are full of insulin, or you don't have enough muscle tissue, or you don't have enough, a working liver or something is just not functioning right or your adrenals are super stressed and already overworked, they're not gonna knock, and, or they're not gonna let insulin knock on the door and say, hey, will you take some of this sugar for us? Uh-uh, it's gonna make its own storage store, storage um, compartments on the body in new fat cells. So that is metabolic inflexibility comes when you have an insulin resistance problem. I hope that makes sense. And then Ari, you can talk about caffeine on empty stomach because I'm a culprit of this one. Oh, yeah, me too. Sometimes. I think <laughs> this is a hard one. <laughs> and the good thing is it doesn't necessarily affect everybody. It really depends on you. It's a very bio-individual thing if you can handle caffeine on an empty stomach. But um, like we talked about before, this can be a stress for some people. You know, if you're first thing in the morning, you're getting that caffeine can kind of offset sometimes your cortisol levels and raise it a little bit. And what that does is also causes in some people... Um, you could, if you really wanted to take a test, you could do like, um, you could test your blood sugar after having caffeine on an empty stomach and see if it affects you. That could be kind of a gauge to see if this is okay for you or not. Um, which is something I should probably do myself, to be honest with you. Like I'm not perfect either, but, um, yeah, you know, if you do that and if it is a stressor on your body, it can elevate your blood sugar and cause you to have one of those spikes without even having something sugary. So it also goes to show that when our body is stressed out, it kind of does that sometimes. It kind of offsets our blood sugar and causes those spikes. So it's not always necessarily you're eating too much sugar. Sometimes it can really just be because your body's in that fight or flight and it's trying to protect itself. Um, another important thing that we're going to talk about, I think the next slide actually is um, the balance eating balanced meals. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> so it's kind of learning how to mitigate these symptoms and the best practices to avoid. So here's this little graphic I got from this Instagram that I love, Hormone Healing RD, which shows, you know, just a perfect picture of what your plate should be looking like if you want a balanced meal. And obviously it's different for everybody. You know, maybe some people can tolerate more fat than others. Um, protein doesn't always have to be the same, but you want to aim for at least a fistful of protein, um, maybe 25 to 30 grams, depending on your body weight and your activity levels. Um, a fibrous carb. So here we have a picture of a little sweet potato, um, but that could be any complex carbohydrate. I mean, it could even really be rice, you know, something that's maybe a little more starchy, but it doesn't necessarily have to be you know, the super clean thing, it can be pasta. You can fit that in, but you need to balance your meal. You need to make sure you're eating protein with it. And we have our non-starchy ve non vegetables. Um, so we have some broccoli, um, some greens there, or you can have, you know, Brussels sprouts, like any type of vegetable can be put there. And that we want to take up half of our plate and then a little bit of a uh, healthy fat. So even a drizzle of olive oil, or you can do shown there, we have a little avocado. Um, or avocado oil even, you know, in your salad dressing. So, you know, it doesn't always have to be like a piece of bacon. You know, a lot of people, like they do the keto diet to control their blood sugar. They're eating slabs of <laughs> bacon and butter and things like that. No, like that's not necessary. You don't need to necessarily add all this fat. It just needs to be something healthy um, to support your blood sugar by kind of like Danielle talked about before, when we eat these vegetables and um, protein, it helps us kind of our bodies to absorb that, effect from the carbohydrates and kind of cushion that blood sugar spike that we may get if we're just eating a plate of pasta by itself. Does that make sense, <laughs> Danielle? Yeah, I like that. And I, um, I really like this. I didn't change this graphic. Look at me, that being a <laughs> control freak. Um, but I really like this graphic because it shows, I like how you put the fibrous carb or just a starchy carb there because how many of us grew up knowing that spaghetti was supposed to fill the whole plate and then you put a little bit of sauce and your meat on there and like the, the noodles outweighed the sauce and the meat. 
And really the pasta, what I've learned how to balance my own blood sugar is that the pasta should be no more for me, no more for me than a quarter of my plate. So I need to have a protein that takes up at least, at least a third of my plate, honestly. So my, and I do a lean protein, um, just because you can always find fats. You can always find carbs. It's really hard to find just plain lean protein. Um, but that is something I would recommend too. Like when you go to a steakhouse or you go, wait, we have just been taught, oh, we eat the bread and butter first mm -hmm. and then we eat the salad when it comes out and then we eat the potato and the meat. Um, I would recommend waiting to eat your salad, waiting to eat the bread until you have started eating with protein, eating the protein. Why? Why start eating with the protein? Because the protein is going to trigger your stomach acid. It is it's going to trigger the hormones to start the digestive process and start your blood sugar balancing, like preparing the enzymes from your pancreas, the, the liver to prepare the bile and be ready to go to absorb all of these foods that you're going to eat. Something, again, we've all been taught, finish your vegetables, finish your vegetables. And I'm not opposed to that. But in our culture today, it is so hard for everybody to get enough lean protein. Aria was very generous. I'm going to say even up to 45, 50 grams of protein per meal per day. If you are an adult eating less than 100 grams of protein, you're not getting enough. I'm sorry. And the older you get, the more active you are, um, the more uh, health issues you have, the more protein you actually need. Unless you have kidney issues, and we can talk about that at another time. Um, but the more you need more protein, the older you get and preferably animal-based protein is the most bioavailable and best absorbed and utilized in our body. I'm going to throw this in here too, because well, I'm going to, there is a faction of people out there trying to take away our meat from us, um, and try to take away even sustainable farming and all of that from us. And they're wanting us to eat crickets. Yep. Crickets. And these crickets the studies that have been done on them right now say, yes, they have so much protein in them per like per little one. Like it's amazing. It looks so promising, but we don't absorb all of that protein. We can't, we were not created to be able to absorb that kind of protein in there. And it's missing all of the vitamins and minerals that typical meat has in it that we need to survive. Yes. Can I add something to the cricket thing? <laughs> Please do. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I recently watched a video kind of about this and about how, you know, the way of the, the global powers that be or whatever are trying to, you know, implement this, uh, bug based diet, whatever <laughs> for protein. So according to actual research, the woman that was making the video, she put, had a bag like this of crickets. You would need this much of crickets to get a hundred grams of protein or something like that, as opposed to, you know, eating your typical three square meals a day with your animal based proteins. So yes, it's an animal, but it's not <laughs> the same, you know, it's, it's nowhere near as nutritionally comparable is what I'm trying to say. Even yeah. if you ate the bag, <laughs> which who wants to do that? <laughs> I'm sorry. That's a lot. And that's going to like, make, anyway. Yeah. Anyway. Sorry. I had to add that. Cause that was like mind blowing. <laughs> that's funny. Um, something else to add in here to mitigate, I would say um, snacks. If you have to have a snack and you are really trying to stay away from hanger, um, I would make sure that you have a snack. If it's, you know, if you're going to have an apple, don't have an apple naked, meaning don't have it without a protein and or a fat. So a lot of my clients enjoy taking apple slices and wrapping prosciutto around it or having a ham slice with it or something like that. Um, just don't eat even good, good, quote unquote, good foods. Don't eat good vegetables without a, or don't eat them naked. That yes. makes sense. Totally agree. Um, all right. So we could have gone so much deeper <laughs> and we could have taken forever through this. Again, this is one of my favorite topics of all time. I just helped a client drop her A1C down a full point from, or I guess it was 1.1 point. So she was 7.2 in just uh, a month and a half of working with me. We have dropped it down to 6.1 um, and just getting through that with some of the courses on the wilderness of wellness. We've also dropped the same woman's um, uh, cholesterol levels from um, 80 points in just a month and a half. She is taking no medicines for that and it is wonderful to witness and it's just testimony that the foods we eat 
how we eat them and our lifestyle, it can change everything. So if you are ready to go deeper, enjoying this content, you are welcome to join the Wilderness of Wellness today. You can head to the website, cryingandmycheesecake.com and take a look at what the Wilderness of Wellness offers. Thank you so much for being here for the uh, CIMC monthly webinar. I am so grateful that you are watching or listening. Uh, it truly is humbling. If you appreciate this kind of content in this episode, uh, would you please consider uh, supporting the show by going to buymeacoffee.com slash CIMC. We do pay for a video editor and an audio editor so we can continue to pump out more episodes for you and just get that word out there. So I hope you had a great time and I'll talk to you soon. Until next episode.